Hello, I am Jay Collins, and this is Nightmare Series 4, Episode 5, which was first broadcast on the 5th of October, 1990. It's one of my favourite episodes of Series 4. It features some exciting times on Level 2 and Level 3, with Alistair, Harry, Martin, and James. So as I've mentioned before, are my favourite team of the series. After I'd become re-familiarised with Series 1 to 3 on video, I realised that Tregard at the beginning of this episode is making a reference back to the old dungeon ditties in this intro. There's always a place for poetry and literature here in Nightmare Castle, even though we don't do the dungeon ditties anymore. Well, some of those dungeon ditties might qualify as poetry, but definitely not literature. As I have said elsewhere, Dickon really is my favourite Dungeoneer of the series. Alistair is rather awkward as a Dungeoneer in many ways, physically and practically, in how he interacts with people and where he stands, like he's blocking Merlin's close-up in this scene, for example, and he's supposed to be showing us this magnificent weapon we can't actually see what it is. So I think my ideal series 14, if you stick Dickon with Alistair the Visors, that would be a very formidable bunch. But Alistair's team really does impress me in this episode particularly. I've mentioned before how I like this little trick of Merlin's. The team have to work out which of these three priceless objects is actually useful. It's the boot, the shoe, the slipper, which is possessed of the spell run. And that's what they need to get through here so that Ariadne isn't going to be feeling particularly fast and come straight in and eat Alistair without any time for thought or action, like she does with Nikki who goes to her without the means to escape. If you go to Ariadne with the means to escape, she'll hang around not attacking you until you've used it. But that's nightmare gameplay for you, isn't it? It's not always 100% realistic. We have some good team discussion here about which object to take, and they don't all agree. Harry, nearest to Tregard and Pickle, wants to take the magnifying glass. Alistair doesn't agree. It sounds like a bit of a con. And neither do the other two advisors. They all know that the boot, the shoe, the slipper is the correct thing to take. So Harry gives in, acquiesces to their decision because it's a majority decision. And this is very typical of Alistair's team. They do a lot of good thoughtful, in-depth discussion, teamwork, and inevitably, every time they do it, they end up coming to the right decision between them. Now, you can't ask anything more from a nightmare team than that, can you? They get six out of six door monster riddles True or false questions correct, with some good conference and discussion. Alistair is able to make a contribution, at least one contribution there, about gallstones. No, they're in your body, not at Galway Bay at all. They got all three correct with Oakley. They're going to do it now with Dorcas's questions. Have some good, intelligent discussion between them and come out with three correct answers again. They had some good intelligent discussion there with Merlin's little trick, and chose the right object so they are able to progress. Later in the episode, we'll see some very good intelligent discussion, again reaching all the right decisions that the transporter had. I was saying on my previous commentary that Leo's team are not a faultless team, despite 
walks, Jim Morris claimed in the Ifield Franzi. Really, in terms of brain work, discussion, teamwork, decisions made, Alistair's team are faultless. As we'll see later on in the episode, it's not a brain work, decision making problem that ends up killing them. It's simply the fact that Alistair is rather awkward and unmanoeuvrable as a dungeoneer. They're presented with a very daunting new challenge, daunting for them and daunting for us, the audience, who've never seen it before. They go straight to panic stations, unfortunately, and Alistair, being so completely unmanoeuvrable anyway, stands no chance of getting out of the corridor of blades in one piece. And I've always thought that is a great shame. I'm thinking about Majida saying about Daniel's team in the Corridor of Blades. I can't believe they've died here after they come all the way through level 3. It's the game, Majida, the game, says Treyguard. And yes, it is the game. Particularly if Tim Child wants to give you a particularly tough game or a particularly tough aspect to a game you've got in rather a good groove while you're playing and you're playing really well and enjoyably as Alistair's team are doing here. And I do find it a disappointment and a letdown when they're suddenly cut down so close to victory there. I always have and I always will. And as I say, I do think they have justifiably earned their place as the best team in the series. I've mentioned before how I don't think Nightmare is all about the team's individual performance. It's a lot about what Tim Child and friends want to do and when they want to kill them and what scenarios they want to put in before they kill them and so on. But it's partly to do with the team's brain work, performance, teamwork, how well they do on Nightmare. And I really don't think you'll find a team that does better than Alistair's team in that respect. They talk intelligently, they discuss pertinently, and they come to all the right decisions. Show me another team that does that, or has an equally strong claim to being one of Nightmare's best teams. We'll end up with Julie's team from Series 7, and that's about it. Oh, I do love Ariadne's lair in this series. It's great use of Ariadne here in Dunkley Wood. Her two-part attack. Not a four-part attack, but a two-part attack, chasing you into the hollow tree there. And then the big showdown with the web stretching all on the top of the screen. A very significant moment, and of course, a fatal moment, unless you've got something to deal with the situation. Unless your name's Dickon. But they're still not staging it right, really, are they? They should have learned from the very awkward Ariadne scene with Helen not to have Ariadne crawling in really slowly from the back and the tree stump really close to the door so you could just quickly pick up the gold and dash out before Ariadne gets to you. But at least run is a shorter spell than freeze. And the team are much quicker about getting round to casting it, Harry realises to do it, than Helen's team were. That scene with Helen and Ariadne is awfully awkward, and really should have been fatal for the team. If the gameplay was real in any way, it would have been Ariadne hanging around for ages and ages, Rachel very slowly realising to cast the freeze spell and then very slowly casting it. Not a good scene at all. That one with Alistair is much better. Spellcast, run quickly. Spellcasting, R-U-N, whoosh, off he goes. But it would look even better if it was staged. 
more like it is later in the series with the tree stump further away from the door. I don't really like the way they start having Ariadne coming in from the side. I suppose the intention being that it looks like she's coming to block the path of the dungeon here. But I don't think it looks very good. I think they should have the tree stump a long way away from the door and Ariadne coming in from the bottom of the screen. A quick action with magic is required. Oh, I do love this sequence with the Dun's Water, the boatman, crossing to the Tower of Time, Leeds, Castle and Kent. A brilliant way to change levels, or almost change levels. You're not on level 3 until you get to the bottom of the stairs, are you? But it's a great sequence. Probably my favourite outdoor sequence from Nightmare. Rowing across the Dun's Water to get to level 3. Great stuff. I was talking about Paul Valentine being impatient on my previous commentary when he's playing the boatman there and he has trouble getting the dungeoneer to approach him and give him the gold and it takes ages and then he finally manages to get his fingers around the gold and claps it sarcastically into his other hand in a very impatient, peevish manner before grudgingly directing, pointing the dungeoneer to get into the boat. That's classic Paul Valentine. Adding some of his own impatience into the characters he plays. These stairs that take you down into level 3 are from Castle Rising in Norfolk. It's still a great atmospheric bit of eye shield work here, much as people hate the eye shield. I do love the atmosphere, the sense of journey it adds to the quest, as long as the sequences don't go on too long. And that disembarking from the boat after crossing the Dun's Water, going through the door, coming round the corner and down those stairs into level 3, that's some of the most atmospheric, nightmare, significant, ooh, level 3 moments for me. Not as good as the minecart ride, I must admit but very well placed in this series as we branch out into outdoor locations. The feeling of the epic journey through Dunkley Wood, across the Dun's Water and then down to level 3 works extremely well for me. I've always engaged with it very much. And level 3 begins with this new challenge, as I mentioned, the transporter pad, which I do like quite a lot. It's one of the few new pieces of David Rowe artwork for Series 4, and there's another piece of new David Rowe artwork for Series 4 superimposed behind the transporter area there with the subterranean cave area. David Rowe does some lovely work for much of Nightmare, of course, but particularly, I think, for Series 4, Level 3, adding to its very nice very atmospheric setting. I do like it very much. This is the best, or perhaps the better, appearance of the transporter pad. It does have a brief third appearance, the Giles, but they don't actually get to start the puzzle because the season comes to an end. It's edited better than Dickens' version. I do prefer the transporter effect without the blue lightning, actually, that Dickens gets. I think the blue lightning is overkill. But even more importantly, the guys in the editing suite remember to let Alistair step back to the middle before making him disappear, and they don't for Dickens, which really contradicts what Pickle says. Return always to the middle, but the editors may spoil that by making you disappear when you're on the red stone. Of course, in practical terms, the reason the Dungeoneer has to step back into the middle is that the Dungeoneer never actually moves and is on the same three stones all the time. So in order to appear in the middle on the next one, they have to step back. Makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, on that third one, they make him disappear too early. Starting bad habits there that they're going to carry on with Dickon. And Dickon is instructed to step over that final red transporter bit. 
so that he doesn't touch. And Alistair just sidesteps right over it. I mean, Dickens' version probably makes more sense. But I don't think it really matters either way. And I do think Alistair's advisors there do a better job than Dickens' advisors actually talking through the puzzle and working it out. Alistair becomes one of those dungeoneers there who tries to help without really knowing what's going on. Right hand paths always. No, left, left. Yes, Alistair, you don't want to be going right there because you can't see how you'd be immediately killed by the armoured knight if you did. But as I say, the advisors do an excellent job there, working it out. They have some better thoughts than Dickens' advisors, and I find them much more endearing doing it, really, than Dickens' advisors. I guess because they're that little bit younger and cuter. We could die because of this, you know. Yeah, we could die if we go the other way. Tregard and Pickle enjoy their discussions and interactions as well. They're enjoyable, but importantly, of course, they always come to the right decision. And that's why Alistair's able to get through here to the clue room and give the green gem to Malice. Even when I was seven, I did wonder, why do they need prompting to do the calling straight away when they find these objects? Helen's team did. There's a reward for that object, I believe, with the bracelet for Hordras. Here as well, Alistair's team are quickly deciding to take the green gem, and then, oh, what else shall we take? Traylor has to find out. Don't you think it's time to redeem your pact with the lady? And then Martin realises, oh yeah, of course, then we can take two more objects. They're stuck in Series 3 prototype. Chris gets the hourglass for Hordris mode. The spell Hero is a reward from Malice there. I remember thinking in the first place, oh, she's not as generous as Hordris, is she? I suppose that fits their characters more. He gave Helen two spells, but just one spell is a reward for Alistair. Hero. And wouldn't it be nice to know what exactly that would have done? It may summon one who is long dead to your cause. Makes it sound like King Arthur or something should come and help Alistair by defeating Mugdred for him. One of those very tantalising scenarios that we never actually get to see play out on screen in Nightmare. Frustrating stuff. And of course when the spell hero is given out again in series 5 and cast, and I think, ah, now we'll find out what it would have done in series 4 if Alistair had got round to casting it. Oh, no, it summons Sir Hugh in Series 5. It wouldn't have done that in Series 4. So it's forever going to remain a mystery. And here's the fatal moment. I was quite happy, having seen this corridor before. We're trundling along. Nothing's going to happen. Ah! Big blades are suddenly coming. It's the debut of the Corridor of Blades. This is most unfair, Master says Pickle. He agrees with me, it is most unfair. Traegard banging the arms of his chair in pure panic there, hoping the team are going to get Alistair out of the way of the blade. Unfortunately, as I say, they've gone to panic stations. They can't talk and discuss and make the right decision here. They just needed to think and act more quickly than they did without bothering to try and explain to Alistair there are blades coming at you. But more to the point, Alistair is so unmanoeuvrable, he doesn't react quickly enough. It's a real trap for them, this. Alistair was bound to get cut in half there. Pickle tries to help by saying two steps, but Alistair doesn't cotton on, and trying to get him to step out of the way that final blade that cuts him in half on the left there. He only takes one step to the right. He's still well within range, and he does it so slowly. But what a complete ambush that was. 
and a great shame to see such a high quality quest brought to an end so abruptly. And like Pickle says, it really is most unfair. It was bound to happen. They were bound to get rather panicked. They're only young. Alistair was bound to get cut in half. He's completely unmaneuverable. In this dream scenario I've come up with, where Dickon is in the dungeon and Alistair's advisors are guiding him. That would be interesting to see in the corridor of blades, wouldn't it? Dickon is very good at darting about, avoiding the blades. His advisors are very good at remaining calm and directing him properly in the corridor of blades to give them their due there. If you put Alistair's younger, rather panicky advisors in that situation with Dickon, how would they do? That would be the acid test of how good a fantasy team that really makes, wouldn't it? As Tregard says there, what a shame. I really did think they'd go all the way, which is something he says again a few years later when he bids an unexpectedly early good night to the cheeky girls. I must admit, I'd kind of forgotten that you could go all the way and win this game, or at least I knew it was possible in theory, but I had no memory specifically of it actually happening, with Helen's death late in level 3 there, and then Alistair's. I thought, well, nobody's ever going to win this, are they? Even if anyone ever did in the first place. I knew, I remembered, that in Series 3 there were no winners, and a big deal was made about it. But I must have known, in theory, that before that, somewhere in the first two series, people had won. But I had no memory of it, no concept of what it would be like. It's really added to the excitement of seeing Dickon win later in the series. But, truth be told, looking back in the cold light of day, despite Dickon's wonderful appeal as a Dungeoneer, I'd much rather it have been Alistair's team had won here. And what I say is, why not let them do it? Why give them the Corridor of Blades in the first place? Haven't they been through enough to prove themselves worthy of a win? Haven't they come to all those correct decisions? Succeeded in all those challenges, including the transporter pad? Well, I think they'd done more than enough to win, and I'm very disappointed still that they didn't. And it's not like we don't need a winner to keep the audience interested. We haven't had one since Julian. This isn't the only time that when there's a lot of series left to play around with, Tim Child and friends are rather inclined to do everything in their power to stop the most deserving winners win, in my opinion. Thanks for listening to this commentary on Nightmare Series 4, Episode 5. I'm not sure if there's really any significance to why I've done three Episode 5s in a row. Perhaps it's true that in all cases the series is starting to pick up and get rather exciting there. And that's why I've chosen those episodes before I even realised they were all episode 5. But then thinking about series 5, I thought, well, surely I'm not going to end up commentating in this new series of eight commentaries on four episode 5s in a row. That would just be ridiculous. But then what did I discover? That if you join me again next time, you'll hear me talking about series 5, episode 5.